Cases like this one are just so unfair because it's not right that a murder victim never gets justice. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Paul Hertel. Viewer discretion is advised. I'm going to apologize in advance. This is sort of the downside when I pick cases at random because that's how I choose my cases I cover each time. So sometimes I'll have a stretch of videos where I have a plethora of information that I can use. And sometimes they go through a stretch where I choose a case and there's virtually no information. And this unfortunately is one of those cases. I don't really have any real background information on anyone involved here or very little at least. And I have really no photos either. I have a couple of pictures, but I, I hate when there's no pictures available like that. Ugh, I love to like show images of you know, crime scenes and stuff like that. But sadly, this is not one of those. Paul Hertel was born on July 27th, 1924. And at the time this case occurred, he is living in, I guess, the town or the city of Richardson, Texas. At this point, Paul is 72 years old. He is married. He does have a few children. And he would spend his free time outside on his lawn doing some gardening and planting things. And he was just enjoying a relaxed, retired life. But on August 13th, 1996, this kind of quiet and peaceful neighborhood there in Richardson was shocked by a brutal murder. 72-year-old Paul Hertel had been shot in his own backyard. He had been shot twice, once in the chest and once point blank in his head. He was pronounced dead at the scene. According to a neighbor, a witness who observed essentially this happening, the very first suspect, and really the only suspect in this case, was Paul's sort of ex-son-in-law, David Thompson. Back in 1991, Paul's daughter, Suzanne, would meet David Thompson at an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting, and the two of them started to date. And then, uh, several months later, she became pregnant with their first child. Suzanne was really excited to become a mom, and Paul was happy to be a grandfather. But as their relationship moved forward, Suzanne and Paul and other family members began to notice that David Thompson had a really abusive and kind of scary side to him. He was very verbally abusive to Suzanne. He would have these sudden outbursts of just complete anger. He one time took her, Suzanne, and threw her against a wall. This was in response to the fact that Suzanne simply said hello to a male neighbor. David Thompson said, oh, you're having an affair with him, you're cheating on me, you're being unfaithful. All she did was say hello to the neighbor. After he throws her into a wall, he grabs her and says that unfaithful wives deserve to die. Suzanne, who's now in this abusive relationship, and as we've discussed many times, these are not easy to get out of. She was hoping, against all hope, that maybe when he became a father, David would calm down. That did not happen. After the baby was born, David would come home from work on numerous occasions. The house, to his standards, wasn't clean enough, and he would angrily scream at her and become abusive towards her. He was so mad that he took a plate full of food one time and he threw it full force into their baby's nursery and almost hit the baby. At that point, fearing for her child's life and her child's safety, she takes the baby and she moves out of the house and she moves in with her parents. She immediately goes to the courts and asks for total custody of the baby. And she is essentially granted full custody, but David Thompson is legally required to have visitations with his son. Every time he had a visitation with the, with the son, Suzanne was there, but she was always terrified that David was going to do something. He was going to hurt her, hurt the baby. And at one point, he actually hinted that he would abduct the baby if he needed to. And there was nothing she could do. She was legally required to give him visitations. Her hands were tied. Then, during the Labor Day weekend of 1993, all of those fears became reality. David, during one of the visitations, kidnapped their child. 
He left a note for Suzanne saying that you will not see your son again until he is at least 17 years old. In that letter, he also stated that she needs to be strong because that one day very soon, her father, Paul, would be dead. And he asked in the letter, and once your father is dead, who then will you cling to? For the next 10 months, David and the baby were gone. They couldn't find him. But then by sheer luck, on June 23rd, 1994, David and the baby were found in South Carolina. The baby was unharmed. David was arrested and the baby was returned to Suzanne. And at that point, David was completely stripped of all of his visitation rights. Unbelievably, because I guess because he was technically still allowed visitations and he the baby was his child, I guess they didn't really consider this kidnapping, just that he violated the written legal order. And so he was only given 10 years probation. He was not put in jail for what he did. Over the next couple of years, Paul Hertel, Suzanne's father, he began to express his fears that this wasn't over, that David Thompson was going to do something again. He was going to do something worse. He was either going to harm Suzanne or he's, Paul even said, I fear that he's going to kill me. Based on what he said in that one letter that one time, it sounds like he wants me dead. But I guess, legally speaking, David hadn't actually directly threatened him or anything. And so I guess the police, they couldn't do it. It was like their hands were tied. It was a very gray area, essentially. But then on August 13th, 1996, those fears became reality. Paul Hertel was shot twice and it was witnessed by a neighbor from a pretty good distance. And the neighbor described this person who shot Paul as looking very much like David Thompson. The, the witness said that they heard a pop and they saw Paul fall to the ground. Then they saw the shooter, who looked like David Thompson, raise his arm again with the gun and shoot Paul directly in his head at, at close range, killing him. Paul Hertel is then laid to rest, and a day after his funeral, Suzanne gets a letter from David Thompson. In that letter, David apologized for what he did. He said he was sorry and that he himself, he was going to commit suicide because he had taken another human's life. And that's what he deserves to have happened to him, is to kill himself. And then at that point, they never heard from David ever again. They never saw him again. And But Suzanne was like, I don't buy it. I don't think he's going to kill himself. We don't know where he is. And they had no reason to believe that he was actually dead anywhere. And they were kind of just sort of afraid. This guy was just around. Where is he? Could he come back and harm them again? Could he kidnap the child again? They didn't know. But they did charge David Thompson with first degree murder, despite not actually having him because he ran, he fled. And he was at that point a wanted fugitive. They were able to tell that he made a bunch of high ticket purchases with all of the credit cards he had. He maxed out all of his credit cards. They then found out that he sold all of those items that he bought. He sold them so he could get cash. They believe he earned somewhere around $12,000 or so in cash on based on this. And this was all around the time where when Paul was shot and killed and then David had fled. They also noticed uh, that he had purchased some camping gear, and so they kind of assumed, well, maybe he's hiding out in the woods somewhere. And they searched for him, but they never found him anywhere. But four months later, four months after Paul Hertel's murder in San Diego, California, my old stomping grounds, well, specifically Oceanside, but that's essentially San Diego County, a man fitting David Thompson's description was arrested for burglary. This man was convicted of that burglary and he was sentenced to a year in prison. He did not go by the name David Thompson, though, in San Diego. However, he was at that point required to put his fingerprints you know, into the system. And once they had his fingerprints, they came up with a wanted fugitive from Texas. A wanted fugitive by the name of David Thompson. And so they knew that the man they actually had was not whoever he said he was, but this man was in fact David Thompson. When confronted with it, David Thompson at that point denies having anything to do with Paul Hertel's murder. He says he didn't do it. Despite a witness seeing, literally seeing him doing it, killing Paul, granted it was just from a distance, so they didn't get like a, def a definite look at the guy, 
but it was someone who fit David's description. But then also you had that letter that was sent to Suzanne where that David admitted to killing Paul and said he would kill himself because what of what he did. Did they do a handwriting match to that? I'm honestly not sure. There is very, very little information with regards to the actual investigation into this. So I don't know. I don't know if they matched handwriting or not. They didn't have the murder weapon. They, whoever did this had clipped through a the chain link fence in, in Paul's backyard and literally waited for Paul to come outside. But there were no like tools left behind that would have had fingerprints. There, there really, from what I can tell, there really was no physical evidence that would show that David actually was the one to kill this. No murder weapon. They, so they had no bullets to match to a certain gun, no fingerprints, no DNA, nothing like that. They had a witness testimony by someone who saw it happen from a distance, and then they had this letter, but that was it. But they still would present the case to a grand jury. And I guess the case against David Thompson was considered no build. I'm not sure what that means. But the grand jury determined that there just was not enough evidence to indict David Thompson for the murder of Paul Hertel. Again, despite the letter, despite the witness, and despite his own behavior, he kidnapped a child and for 10 months, he had verbally threatened Paul before or had made insinuations that Paul was going to die. Paul himself feared for his life and really thought that David was going to kill him or someone in his family, but they, I guess, just, they just didn't have the evidence to indict David, which is insane to me, because who else is there? I mean, nothing was stolen. There was no robbery. This person cut through the back fence and waited for Paul specifically to come out to kill Paul, and he killed him essentially execution style. There was no other suspect. There was no one else they could even think that would have wanted to do this to him. The guy is a retired engineer, a, a well-respected member of, of Richardson, Texas. No one else could have possibly wanted to do this. No one else had any motive to do this other than David Thompson. David Thompson never faced any actual charges for the murder. And... As far as I know, David Thompson, I'm not really even sure where he is now, but he is free. He w he was released from custody and was never rearrested for this ever. In 2000, Paul Hertel's wife, Christine, she passed away and she never got to see justice get done. And no one has. No one has been able to see justice come through for this family. The fact that he was able to kidnap a child for 10 months and only got 10 years probation for that and no actual jail time was insane. And the fact that he was the only likely person to have killed Paul and to have gotten away with it, it's insane. Now, he did actually get sentenced to four years in prison for violating that 10 year probation for kidnapping the child. So he got four years for that, but not for murder. Make it make sense. It's insane. I mean, I understand you need physical evidence. You can't just rely on a letter that they do or don't know. I'm not sure if David actually wrote and the testimony of a witness who admittedly saw it happen from a distance. That's really all they had. And I know you need evidence, but it's just frustrating that it's like, you know who did it. You know who did this, but there's nothing they could do about it. That's so frustrating. The guy is clearly very unstable. He kidnaps children and, and he kills people and he was just out there now. And sadly, even now when I'm filming this in August of 2024, Paul Hertel and his family have never gotten the justice that they rightfully deserve. But unfortunately, that is the end of this case, True Crime, Aruni Dooney Dingleberry Dongs. I hope you found it interesting. Uh, as usual, if you are new here, hello, I'm Mike. I tell true crime stories here, obviously, on YouTube. So please subscribe and give the video a like. And also, you can follow me over on TikTok. I have a couple different pages where I tell short form true crime stories. The links to those are in the link tree in the description of this video below. The links also pop up here in this corner in the beginning and at the end of the video. 
Check those pages out if you want to. You don't gotta, but you can if you wanna. Also in the link tree below, you'll find my um, merch store. We have like t-shirts and hoodies, stuff like this. The owl did it t-shirt anyway. You know. We do ship all over the world, so feel free to check it out if you want to. And then lastly, in the description below, you also find my email address where if you want to, you can recommend a case to me. Uh, just send me a super quick email with the name of the case, where it happened, when it happened. I'll then add that case to my list. The list is 6,300 names long. Like I said at the beginning, I choose my cases completely at random, so I cannot promise you when I'll cover your case, but I will get to it eventually. But yeah, that is it for this video, True Crime Aroonies. Let's end this video, like I did with the previous one, with a dad joke. What does a baby computer call its father? Data. <clears throat> Stupid. I only seem to get sick on weekdays. I must have a weekend immune system. Badoom. -tsh. What do you call a Frenchman wearing sandals? Philippe Flop. God damn it. It's not funny. It's not funny. I just found out that I'm colorblind. This news came out of the purple. <laughs> oh, God. Okay, well, I'm, we're just going to end it there. So, <laughs> anyway, that's all for now, Drew Cry Maroonage. <laughs>